Hello and welcome back to Planet 40k. Today we've got another video for you and I'm going to be explaining why I think the Ghost Arc is the most underrated unit within the Necron Codex. Before getting into today's video, I just wanted to kindly remind you if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, then please do so below clicking that red button. We're putting out Necron content, we're trying to up the frequency, we're probably going to be doing two to three videos a week at the moment. So subscribe and hit that bell to not miss out on any future content. So today is the turn of the Ghost Arc. I'm going to be trying to do this with COVID, but I'm sure I can plough through this video. So the Ghost Arc, we of course begin with the data sheet. So these things are coming in at 8 power level or 145 points for the single Ghost Arc. And it's going to be coming in your dedicated transport slots. So you will require one infantry unit within your detachment in order to field the Ghost Arc. So let's break down the stats to begin. So the movement is 12 inches, the weapon skill is 6 plus. Blitter skill 3 plus, strength and toughness is 6, wounds 14, attacks 3, leadership 10 and a 3 plus armor save. So it does have a degrading stat line so the movement, the ballistic skill and the amount of attacks that the model actually gets will degrade when it loses wounds. So when it goes down to 7 wounds remaining it will be bracketed so the movement goes down to 8 inches, the ballistic skill goes up to 4 plus and the attacks goes to d3. Now the attacks isn't too important but it's mainly the movement and the ballistic skill. Then furthermore when it goes down to 3 wounds or less it can only move 4 inches it will have a ballistic skill value of a 5 plus and only one attack. So the main stat of interest here is the movement being 12 inches so it's pretty quick and the wounds being 14 so it's pretty tanky. So onto the keywords, of course it's a vehicle model, it's got the quantum shielding ability, it's a vehicle and it has the fly keyword. And then going back to that transport keyword, of course it's a transport model and it can transport up to 10 Necron warriors or up to 10 Necron character models that are within the same dynasty as the Ghost Ark. So you can't take 10 warriors as well as a character model, it's going to be either the warriors or the character. They can't do both in the same transport. Ability wise, living metal of course, regain a lost wound at the start of the turn, which is pretty decent because it does have a degrading stat line. So regain a lost wound at the start of each turn is pretty decent. It also has the command protocols if you're within 6 inches of a character model. Fair enough if you're using them. It's got the quantum shielding ability so it can't be wounded on less than a 4+. plus. So the high strength weaponry are still going to need force to wound, even if it's strength 10, strength 14, it doesn't matter, it still requires a 4 to wound. Then alongside that toughness 6, it makes it pretty decent. It's then got the hovering ability, which isn't really an ability, it's more of a games cleanup. So you're measuring from the hull of the actual model as opposed to the base of the model, because sometimes the hull of the model is larger than the base. So in this case, you're measuring from the actual model itself. It's got the explode ability, so once it's destroyed, you roll a d6, on a 6 it's going to explode, and units within 6 inches are going to suffer D3 mortal wounds. It's pretty standard for a vehicle model. But the main ability here for a Ghost Arc is the Repair Barge ability. So if you've got a unit of warriors that are within 6 inches of the Ghost Arc, you can bring back D3 lost warriors each and every turn, and this happens in your command phase. So you've got to bear that in mind on your movement phase from the previous turn. If they're not within 6 inches in your own command phase, it's not going to happen. So make sure they're always within 6 inches of the Ghost Arc. So the last part of the data sheet is the actual war gear that the Ghost Arcs are going to be taking. So they've got two Gorse Freya arrays, which are 24 inch range, rapid fire 5, strength 4, minus 1 AP and 1 damage. So the fact that you've got two of these means you've got 10 shots and if you're within rapid fire range that will be 20 shots and they're virtually the same weapons as the Necron Warriors take the Gorse Flayers. So it's the equivalent of having 10 Necron Warriors in terms of the war gear. Okay so that's the data sheet all dealt with, let's get on to the in-game uses. Okay, so in-game uses. I've got three main uses when I'm using my Ghost Arc. Now the first one just being a transport for your 10 Necron Warriors. You're getting them up the board, getting them onto an objective, getting the Warriors out with their Gorse Reapers because they've only got a 12 inch range. So the Ghost Arc is obviously going to get them into range, possibly onto an objective. If you've got the Nihilat Dynasty or Eternal Conquerors, even better. The second option for me is being alongside a blob of 20 warriors as opposed to having warriors inside the vehicle. So we're just going to go alongside the warriors and when you lose warriors to range attacks or melee attacks, the ghost stock is just basically spitting more out. D3 every single round with its repair barge. And then the third thing I use my ghost arc for is just to simply be a battering ram. I don't put any necron warriors inside, I just have it on its own. Tie units up because it's quick, it's got 12 inch movement and that fly keyword. So I can go up the board, try and tag a unit that likes to shoot so that it prevents them from shooting, especially if they're an infantry unit. They're not going to be able to fire unless they can fall back and fire. But if they don't have that, they're going to be stuck for the rest of the game. Getting through a ghost start with a shooty infantry unit is pretty difficult. So that's the three main uses for me. There's probably more uses that you guys have got, but that's what I do with my ghost arcs. 
So stratagem wise, there's five stratagems that are available to the Ghost Arc. The first one being Stellar Alignment Protocol, and it's going to cost you one single command point. And if you've already been bracketed with your Ghost Arc, so you're simply going to have your best bracket, so you can have your best movement, you're going to have your best ballista skill, and the attacks as well if you really want them. But the main thing is getting that movement and that ballista skill value of a 3 plus with your Gorse Flayers on the side of the Ghost Arc. Option two, which is also one command point, is Curse of the Pharaon. So if you lose your Ghost Arc and it gets destroyed, you don't have to roll to see if it explodes, it will automatically explode. So if you're surrounded by lots of other enemy units, you can just explode this thing. You're going to dish out mortal wounds to all the units around that Ghost Arc. So if you remember from the ability section in this video, units within six inches will suffer D3 mortal wounds. Now that does include your own models as well. Don't forget that it's not just enemy units. It's also your own. So just be a bit aware of that before this thing actually goes boom. The third option in terms of stratagems is Disintegration Capacitors. It's one command point again, and any unmodified hit rolls of a six will automatically wound with your Gorse Flayers. So if you do opt to use this stratagem, you're gonna get a maximum of 20 shots, and that's within rapid fire range, of course. And with the 20 shots, unmodified hit rolls of a six, you might get three, you might get four. Is it worth it? Probably not. I'd save it for something else, such as your Tomb Blades or your Necron Warriors. You're probably not going to use that one, but I'm just mentioning it because it's a Gorse weapon. The fourth one is Quantum Deflection. That's also a command point, and you can exchange your 5 plus invulnerable save from the Quantum Shielding ability to a 4 plus invulnerable save for the Quantum Shielding ability. So it's a much better save, half a chance of just shrugging off anything before it gets to the damage side of things. Then last but not least is Reconstitution Protocols for a command point, and when you're using your Repair Barge ability, instead of bringing D3 Lost Warriors back, you get to bring back D6. Now, I know D6 is a little bit unreliable. You can still roll pretty poorly, one, two, or three, but you've got an okay chance of getting something better for five or six warriors coming back. And then when you pair this alongside other things, such as a Technomancer or a Resurrection Orb, it starts to add up. And then we'll go over that more in the Synergy section of this video, but bear that one in mind when we do go into that Synergy section. So we're on to the Dynasty Codes. What are the best Dynasty Codes for your Ghost Arc? To be honest, most of them are going to work quite well with your Ghost Arc, but I'm going to go through some of the options for you and why. So the first one is from the Nihilat Dynasty, of course, Objective Secured. The fact that it's a 14 wound tank, you can fly this thing straight up the board, get onto an objective, contest it, but because you've got Objective Secured, you could potentially be stealing that objective from right under their nose, and they're not going to clear you off it for quite a while. So not only is that going to be getting you some primary points, you're going to be denying primary points for your opponent, it could even be denying them secondary points if they've got to have enemy units away from that certain objective, so you could be denying that too. You could be using the Mephrit Dynasty to get that extra 3 inches to your Gorse Flayers, so now all of a sudden you're going to have 27 inch Gorse Flayer arrays. So also the Rapid Fire is going to increase as well, so that will be now 13 and a half inches as opposed to a 12 inch Rapid Fire range. And also if you're firing within that Rapid Fire range which has now just been extended, you get an extra bit of AP as well on top of that, so it now becomes a minus 2 AP weapon, which isn't too bad. It's worth mentioning their stratagem, which is Talent for Annihilation, for a command point. Any unmodified wound rolls of a 6 will score a mortal wound on the opposing target, alongside the damage you've just dished out as well. Now this is capped to only 3, but you're probably not going to get 3 with a Ghost Dark if I'm honest. You need 6s to wound. This is probably better served on a Tomb Blade unit, or a large Necron Warrior unit. The Saltic Code is worth noting here as well, because of the fact that they've got the Rapid Fire range increased to 18 inches as opposed to the 12 inches again. So that's of course a little bit better than the Mephrit Dynasty in terms of rapid fire range anyway. So it's not going to add anything to the whole range, it's just the half range that's going to get extended to 18 inches. This one I'd only use if you're using it to tie models down and it's the Novak code. So you're getting that plus one to the charge roll of course. Don't worry too much about the added AP in the first round of the fight. You're not going to need that. You're just there to tie up, bog down a unit so that they can't do anything in their shooting phase. But you want to get that plus one to the charge roll to help you get in to that fight. Custom codes from the Dynastic Traditions, there's only really two of note here, and both of them have already kind of been covered. It's Eternal Conquerors and Butchers for the Objective Secure, or the plus one to the charge. Nothing really fancy there. But as for the circumstances of the Awakening list, there's four here I wanted to talk about. The first one being Healthy Paranoia, which is like the Mephric Code, plus three inches to the range attacks, fairly straightforward. So Isolationists, if you fire rapid fire weapons within 12 inches, is a plus one to the strength. So now all of a sudden your Gorse Flayers will be strength five, within 12 inches. You've then got Interplanetary Invaders, which simply allows the Ghost Arc to fall back and then still fire, but it will be that minus one to hit penalty. But they are actually allowed to fire into combat because they are a vehicle, but if you do fall back and use this, you can select your target as opposed to having to fire it at that actual target within the combat. 
Then the final one, everyone's favourite of course, Relentlessly Expansionist, getting that 6 inch pre-game movement. Whether you've got Necron Warriors aboard your Ghost Ark, or you're flying up the board to tie up something, it's going to help you get to where you want to go. Maybe there's an objective just outside your deployment zone, maybe you want to get into cover, there's lots of different ways you can use Relentlessly Expansionist. Okay, so let's talk about the deployment. How are you going to deploy your Ghost Ark? Well, first of all, I probably wouldn't put it in strategic reserves. I don't think there's a need for it. I would start it on the battlefield, whether they've got warriors in there or not. They're going to start on the battlefield for me. And they're actually tanky enough to put at the forefront of your deployment zone. Again, quantum shielding, toughness 6, 14 wounds. It shouldn't be going bang straight away. Of course, if it gets targeted, it can go. But it is tanky enough to take quite a lot of damage. Something worth mentioning here is just to utilise the actual shape of the Ghost Ark. Bear in mind you can turn this thing sideways, it's going to block a lot of line of sight for models that are hidden behind the ghost arc, and also use that pivot to your advantage as well. You can pivot, do your movement, then pivot back. Again, blocking line of sight to your models. And not only are you blocking line of sight, you're also creating a wall. If an enemy unit is coming round your ghost arc and it doesn't want to get into engagement range of your ghost arc, they've got to stay one inch away from that ghost arc. So therefore, if you create this long barrier, which is the ghost arc itself, and they've got to go all the way around it, it's going to cost them movement. So that's the best way of utilising the Ghost Ark, is to simply create a bigger wall, force your opponent to go around it, or charge it. So before moving on with the rest of this Advanced Tactics video, I just wanted to alert you to our sponsor, which is the Magnet Baron. And this one is actually going to be relating to the video we're doing today, which is the Ghost Ark. So you can actually get two large flat magnetic flight stands for $11.99 in US dollars. That's if you want the short flight stand. If you want the medium flight stand, it's going to be 12 49 in US dollars. Now these guys ship worldwide and basically made for your Ghost Ark and similar flyers that are within the 40k game. So of course we're going to talk about the Ghost Ark today because that's what we're doing. And the reason why you would take this product is because it's a magnetized stand. So when you're transporting this to a gaming store or a tournament, you can literally take the stand apart, buy the magnets, safely pack it away. It's not going to get broken because a lot of the time when you transport these kind of models, the stands tend to break, they're quite flimsy, and then once the stand is broke, you've got to do a lot of DIY to get it fixed. Then you've got to then buy a stand as well, put the new stand in, whereas the magnet stand is there forever, you pack it away nicely, nothing's going to get broken. So you can see from the image here exactly how it works. This is the Magnet Baron, the link will be in the description below, so check them out once you've seen this video. Okay, so let's get back onto the advanced tactics for the Ghost Ark. So we're now talking synergy. So of course the main synergy here is Necron Warriors. The fact that you can put 10 Necron Warriors within the transport capacity of the Ghost Ark, that's one of the main synergies you're going to have. But there's also the Repair Barge synergy, which is the ability of course, to be bringing back D3 Lost Warriors each and every turn. So there's a very clear and obvious synergy with Necron Warriors. But it's something to note at this stage of the synergy section, that when you're bringing Warriors back with the Ghost Ark, in fact it's not just the Ghost Ark, when you're bringing Warriors back with reanimation protocols in general, you could do a little bit of movement shenanigans when you're bringing them back because you don't have to place them where they actually died. You can just place them within unit coherency of the unit. So if you actually think about that, you can be moving the Necrons forward. Let's say you lost six Necron Warriors and you managed to bring back three of them. Instead of putting the three at the back of the unit where they died, you can put them at the front of the unit and you can literally steal quite a lot of movement. It can even get you onto an objective or make you able to steal an objective just by your reanimation protocols or in this case, the repair barge. That's the main synergy. I just wanted to talk about something that doesn't synergize with the Ghost Ark. It's the non-dynasty specific characters such as Anrak the Traveller. He's not got a dynasty keyword and this requires dynasty characters to go in the Ghost Ark so you can't be putting Anrak the Traveller in there for example. He ain't gonna work. Now there is some indirect synergy also for the Ghost Ark. So you've got your Necron Lords and your Necron Overlords. Now the reason I mentioned both the Lords and the Overlords is the fact that they can take a Resurrection Orb. So why is this synergy or indirect synergy for a Ghost Ark? Well the fact that they're bringing D3 Warriors back with the Repair Barge and then when you pair this with the Resurrection Orb you can be literally bringing these Warriors back in mass. Now this one's really important to note. There is an order in which you should do this and the Resurrection Orb is the one that you do first. The reason for this is you get to roll on all the dead warriors within that unit. Let's say you've lost 10 models within that unit of 20 warriors and you're using the Resurrection Orb first. You get to roll 10 reanimation protocol rolls and then after you've dealt with all that you get D3 warriors back or D6 if you're using that stratagem. Whereas if you do it the other way around and you bring D3 back, let's say you bring 2, you've now lost a couple of dice in terms of your Resurrection Orb. You've now only got 8 to roll from. Whereas the D3 is always happening regardless of how many dead models there are 
Whereas the resurrection orb depends on how many dead models there were. So always do the resurrection orb first and then do anything else afterwards. Then you want to further boost this. Of course, it isn't just a resurrection orb. You can get the relic orb, which is the orb of eternity. So it will be a 4 plus reanimation roll as opposed to a 5 plus. So that's with the lords and the overlords. And sticking with the overlords, they've got the my will be done ability. So it's going to be a plus one to their hit rolls, which is obviously going to affect the Necron Warriors. It's not going to help with the Ghost Arc, but the Warriors are going to be alongside that Ghost Arc. So they're going to get that plus one to their hit roll, meaning that they're going to be hitting on twos. More indirect synergies, having the Technomancer with the Rites of Reanimation ability. Again, bringing D3 Lost Warriors back, very similar to the Repair Barge. Now note with the Repair Barge ability, as well as the Rites of Reanimation ability, the last line says each unit can only be selected for this ability once per phase. Now these abilities are completely separate from one another, they're not the same ability, so you can combine them both. You can get D3 Lost Warriors with the Repair Barge, and D3 Lost Warriors with the Rites of Reanimation, all on the same turn. And of course, before both of those, you can opt to use the Resurrection Orb as well. Now going back to some more direct synergy, again sticking to the Technomancer, if you're taking the Canoptic Cloak, the Technomancer can heal a Dynasty model D3 Lost Wounds in the Command Phase, which actually means he can be healing the Ghost Arc D3 Lost Wounds. He's not going to do anything with the Warriors because they've only got one wound each, but he can be healing that Ghost Arc, the Ghost Arc, and the Technomancer is healing the Warriors. It's all a big circle. You can even further boost his survivability by bringing Cryptothrolls to guard the Technomancer. And then even further, you can get a Canoptic Spider with the Fabrication Claw Array. He can also be healing the Ghost Dark D3 Lost Wounds a turn as well. So there's loads of healing shenanigans that can go off when you've got Ghost Darks and Warriors and Overlords and Technomancers and Canoptic Spiders. Like I said, it's just one big circle of healing. Everyone's healing everybody. It's quite an indestructible force. So the way I would use these guys is get them into the centre of the board, completely dominate an area, especially if there's primary objectives on there, and your opponent's going to have a really tough time getting through this. The only thing it probably does lack is having a Royal Warden, just to get them out of combat if they were to get caught in combat. That's the only thing that I'd probably suggest there. I know that's now quite a large investment, Technomancers, Royal Wardens, Overlords, Ghost Arcs, Warriors. It's quite a large investment in their list, so it's probably ideally only used for a larger game, say 2,000 points, as opposed to a 1000 point game. So last bit of synergy before we get onto the secondary objectives tactics, and this is for one of the protocols, which is the protocol of vengeful stars. So directive one, any unmodified wound rolls of a six will increase the AP by one. Yeah, it's not too bad. It does give you minus two AP on your gorse flayers. Or directive two, if you're firing within half range, your opponent is not gonna get the benefits of cover. Command protocols aren't really my thing, but that's the one that kind of synergizes with a ghost dart. Okay, so let's get on to the secondary objectives and what you could do with your Ghost Arc in order to score some points. Now, we're not going to be talking about primaries. We've already kind of gone over that. We don't need to talk about that. But in terms of the secondary objectives, from the No Mercy, No Respite list, there's To The Last. Now, To The Last, admittedly, is quite a risky one. You're literally putting it in your opponent's hands. They could just focus target against your Ghost Arc and then you've just lost five points. But if you're playing a smaller game, a thousand point game, for example, there's not going to be that much that can take on a 14 wound model with toughness 6 and quantum shielding. So to the last is a good option, if it suffices to the end of the battle, it's going to get you 5 points, and you're going to select 3 of your most expensive units in order to do this. That's providing that the Ghost Arc is one of the expensive units of course. Also from the No Mercy No Respite list, you've got Grind Them Down. Now I mentioned him Grind It Down because if you can kill more enemy units than you've lost in the battle round, you get 3 points. Then when you're taking vehicles with quantum shielding, they're quite tough to shift. So that makes grind them down a little bit easier to achieve. From the Battlefield Supremacy list, you've got behind enemy lines. Now, the reason I'm mentioning behind enemy lines is because the Ghost Arc's got fly and a 12 inch movement. Very early in the game, it can get to within 12 inches of the deployment zone to start scoring a couple of points every battle round. And if it gets into the actual enemy deployment zone, it will be scoring four points in a battle round. You will need at least two units to be doing so. It isn't going to do it on its own, and there's probably better units that are equipped to do this, like Flayed Ones, Ophidian Destroyers. They're good examples, because they can simply just deep strike into the backfield. But your Ghost Dark is tanky and resilient enough to stay there, and even if it gets targeted, it is likely going to survive quite a long time. Also from that list is Stranglehold. Now I like Stranglehold when you're playing the Nihilic Dynasty or Eternal Conquerors from the Custom Codes. You should be having more objectives than your opponent, and you should have at least three. Now when you've got objectives secured on a Ghost Arc, again, a resilient tanky model, very hard to shift, with objectives secured, you're taking all the objectives, this one's a no-brainer. Then the last one I'll note is engage on all fronts, so you're just getting into the table quarters, 
Again, I'm kind of repeating myself here, but the Ghost Arc is a tanky model. You put it in one of these quarters, maybe on the far end in your enemy's deployment. It's going to take a lot of hits and still survive, and it's going to be scoring you points, providing that you've got at least three quarters in the battlefield. If you've got four, you're going to easily maximise the points. Okay, so into the comparison section of this video. There's not really much to compare. I'm not going to go over the Night Scythe. I know it is a transport option. They're kind of two completely different things here. One literally just brings them in and goes away. The Ghost Type does do a little bit more than a Night Scythe does. It can hold objectives, it's firing, it's weapons, it's transporting. It's doing a little bit more in-game than a Night Scythe does. But what I did want to compare the Ghost Type to which is going to sound a little bit weird, it's actually the Necron Warriors themselves. And this isn't going to be a completely fair comparison, but you'll see in a minute why I'm comparing these. So for 145 points, you're getting your Ghost Arc. It's got Quantum Shielding, it's got the Vehicle Keyword so it can shoot into combat. It's got 14 wounds, it's got Living Metal, Toughness 6, 3 plus Armor Save, but only 3 attacks. Now if you were to get 11 Warriors, that will cost you 143 points. So it's only 2 points less than having that Ghost Arc. Now with those 11 Warriors, you're only getting 11 wounds, not 14. They're only toughness 4, there's no quantum shielding, there's no in run save of course. Now you are getting slightly more firepower with the 11, not by much. They're an infantry model so they can be doing actions. They've got the reanimation protocols and the rerunning ones with the reanimation protocols. And their objective secured because they're a troop unit. So the question kind of is, would you rather 10 warriors within the ghost arc? Would you rather 20 warriors outside the ghost arc? Would you rather 20 warriors and the ghost arc? Because they all kind of do the same sort of thing. The warriors, if you're taking gorse flays with them, have got the exact same weapon as the ghost arc. And the points are very similar. You're taking 11 warriors or a ghost arc. So it's very similar. It's just that one is tanky. One can do actions, has a little bit more firepower. Personally, the way I play with the ghost arc is I have a 20 man warrior blob. I take the ghost arc alongside the warrior blob. And then the warriors are going to be shooting all game. And the ghost arc is simply bringing warriors back. That's personally the way I play it. But I know a lot of people like to just put 10 warriors within as transport and going off and doing their own thing. But I wanted to make that comparison because in smaller games in particular when points are a premium and you're spending 145 points or 143 points in this case, which one would you prefer to have within your game? It's a tricky one. I'd rather go the whole hog, 20 warriors and the ghost up. So community reviews for the Discord. If you haven't already joined the Discord, the link will be below. We do have a free Discord. There is also a members area for the people that are supporting the channel. But in terms of the free Discord, you can get involved in these video reviews. So I usually pick two for every video, and here's the two for today's. So we've got Jake here. He has put situational unit. I wish it can carry a full squad. Warriors aren't durable enough in a 10-man unit in the current climate to get much benefit from resurrection. Although it is nice to have an arc itself be tanky. Not bad, but not great. 5.5 out of 10. But he's then further gone on to say if the Ghost Arc had a capacity of 20 warriors instead of 10, it would be an 8 out of 10 and make every list I write. So that was Jake. Then Simpino, Ghost Arc is wonderful, it has the transhuman and worth a CP to get a 4 plus invulnerable save. It's a go-to to be bringing back warriors, holding only warriors or characters hinders its usefulness. I've yet to use it as a transport, 9 out of 10 and will continue to soak up firepower. So that's two reviews from our Discord. Hopefully more of you will start getting involved in these reviews, get some more people within the community getting their reviews and having their say on the videos. So let's get on to my final thoughts for the Ghost Arc. Now it's been sold to us as a transport option, but I don't really play it as a transport due to its limited capacity of only having 10 warriors as opposed to 20. Now I'd love to see some changes made. Maybe you can put 20 warriors in there, maybe immortals in there or just any infantry models that have only one wound should really be able to go in the ghost arc. Or even better yet, going back to past editions, make it open topped so that the warriors inside can actually shoot out of the vehicle, then I'd be putting 10 in there no problem. Also I would like to have it as 10 warriors plus a character, I think that would be a little bit more beneficial just to get that Marvel Be Done ability and the Relentless March aura when they're disembarking from that ghost arc. But the unit itself to me is more of a battering ram. It's blocking narrow parts of the board, tying up units and doing it pretty quick because of the fact that it's got that 12 inch move and it can fly. It's super tanky and with those objectives secured dynasties. It's a huge point scoring unit for your primaries of course as well as denying primary objectives for your opponent. Now I personally would only play this alongside a Technomancer and an Overlord as well as 20 warriors. None of them need to go in the transport. I would probably need a Royal Warden as well, but now we're talking a big investment and you're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket. But to be honest, I've had quite a lot of success in playing that kind of style. You dominate a key location of the board with this ginormous blob with the Ghost Ark and all these characters. 
and they're almost indestructible because as mentioned there's a big circle that just reviving each other bringing each other back healing one thing healing another thing it's a real pain in the butt to get rid of the entire blob or the ghost arc itself so that's what i think of the unit as for the standby of approval today i think it's competitive but not only do i think it's competitive i think it's the most underrated unit within the codex because it could be like i said it could be tying up things it could be transporting things it could be doing objective secure because it's resilient it could be doing all those secondaries we mentioned i think it's a real winner when you actually start to bring all the tactics together so that's what i think you'll have to let me know what you think in the comments below or on our discord server if you haven't already check the discord out but that's all from me today guys all that's left to say thank you all for watching i'll see you next time